the the idea therefore is situational authority and what the prior play has provided as a constraint for it sometimes that can be numerical sometimes mm -hmm. it can be geographic for lack of a better word you know like the dungeon or any movement around space mm -hmm. sometimes it can be emotional so that a given non-player character's reaction is incontrovertible maybe that reaction also is subject to constraint so that you you know someone has rolled to see whether they've lost you know their their control mm -hmm. Um, or maybe it isn't. Maybe it's just your job to decide when and how much it will take for that person to lose control. So, mm -hmm. but as long as we know what the jobs are and what, what the constraints are going into it, then you never feel, as the person with the authority for the new situation, you never feel stopped. You feel mm -hmm. almost lifted, right, into mm -hmm. the next situation of play. And it's one of the things that I've always enjoyed about my game Sorcerer um, in that this, it has a particularly strong, uh, a particularly strong sense for this. And mm -hmm. so um, the name therefore would simply be all the authorities in their various configurations at every aspect of part of play have constraints on them. What are those constraints? If the constraints on situation are identifiable to outcomes in previous play, that's what we're talking about. Can we look at the outcomes of prior play and see that that is the engine of content of what you cannot say? You're not free to say, well, the chief gets up in the morning and scratches his belly and has a nice day. Not after that, he doesn't. Not after what happened, he doesn't. Well and so um it's that it is i think the confusion about that and the the idea that says well in order to be making fiction that means i get to be able to say whatever i want next that's actually i think a fairly well it's not a very well considered reaction it's not a very well considered principle um mm -hmm. it i can see why people would say it if they had felt restrained by previous systems you see restraint is different from constraint restraint mm -hmm. means you can't do anything mm -hmm. constraint means you get to do plenty but just not those not the one there are things you know you can't do because of mm -hmm. what has already happened. And um, and so the idea of the energy pushing you forward in towards something that you can do is very strong. So mm -hmm. um, if you have had experiences of being restrained by system features, which usually factor into what we were talking about before with control issues going on, right? Somebody's controlling play. If someone's controlling play, you're totally restrained. If someone else is controlling play, you are you are in a straitjacket. You are locked down. You can, you know, you get to say what you're allowed to say. You get to do what you're allowed to do um, by them. And they decide as you go along. You know, you just, you try it sometime uh -huh. with one of these good old, you know, good old, uh, uh, you know, masterful storyteller GMs. You try it sometime and have your character do something that isn't what they want for this scene. They'll just pretend not to hear you. Uh -huh. Or they'll roll, say, okay, roll for it. Oh, you failed, right? I mean, they'll, they'll just shut your ass down. Uh -huh. So if you've had this experience, then when someone gives you a game where you get to say a lot of content, you feel wonderful. You're like, oh, I get to say all this stuff. But you see, you've been misled. You now think that massive infinite freedom is obviously what you want just because you were locked down so badly before. But it's mm -hmm. not a well-considered principle. If prior play doesn't set constraints on situational authority, then play has no plot of worthy of the name. There's no mm -hmm. consequence from thing one to thing two to thing three. 
So does that, uh, what, tell me what you think of that. Uh, this is very interesting. So I'm thinking that from, I think what, what I understand is that what you are saying, that continuity and consequences should matter because they create constraints. And in the previous example, and I see it in other mission-based games, so how, how, how I would call it, uh, good, we yeah. sacrifice the constraints to be able to transition to a different mode of play. So, for example, in Blades, the unresolved constraints are dropped for the sake of maybe a higher hit. Right. And I think a skilled group can bring some of them back, but they have to really want and try to, because, for example, that game allows you to frame so-called free play or the this heat fallout scenes, and you can connect them because you did this, now this happened, because you asked your friend to help you hide right. the body, someone has seen them, and this friend is now Right. Question by the by the uh, blue right. whatever, it is, it, and it is the fact that it is voluntary that makes me feel empty. Yeah, right. And I think what you described is also my personal problem with the mission-based games, where the continuity is so destroyed mm -hmm. from mission to mission, uh, which I sometimes enjoy. Sometimes I don't. For example, I really feel the lack of it in like Sprawl and Monster of the Week, where the GM is told to prepare the set of adventure, but we are also forgetting the constraints on other adventure. So we kill this bunch of innocent people in the in Chicago, but today we are in we are in in Illinois. It doesn't matter what happened in Chicago. Right. right. So yeah, I really right. yeah, it's, it's, I really like this idea. Thing. I'm, I'm thinking too about my game Circle of Hands, which is very strange in this regard, because in Circle of Hands you do play very separate instances of the travels of these characters. But the weird thing is that you're not playing the same character twice, not in a row. Right. Mm -hmm. You have to switch characters. So what you are getting is a very soft comparison between what happened last time and what happens this time. Someone else may be playing a character that you played last time. So the uh -huh. continuity of character from one situation to the next is actually transferred to another person. It's not your character. Now you get to watch their interpretation of that character based on what you did. So there's uh -huh. a weird set of constraints that are rise and fall and are present or absent in different ways from situation to situation in that game. Mm -hmm. So it's, it, I, I don't, I'm not saying that the constraints in question have to be so fixed. Although while working with these ideas, we tend to focus on the examples where they are very fixed, just so we can stay clear mm -hmm. in our minds. So, um, it is one of the soft features of both Troll Babe and Circle of Hands for the characters to change their minds about certain things. The question huh? is whether they do. Um, and so some of the interesting procedural constraints, for example, that you cannot play the next character, the same character again right away are aimed at that in a fashion that you don't really get from reading it on paper. It's a, this was a game that was built out of playing it and a lot of the procedures and emergent effects I know occur because we did them and I see them occur when other people play and I don't bother explaining that they're going to occur. So, so I guess I'm trying to say that, you know, when we're, when a person is thinking about these issues, recognize that there are some games with very soft and indirect and weird versions of constraint mm -hmm. out there. They're not all just, you know, fixed. I'm quickly describing some notes so that I remember. No, that's fine. Uh-huh. 
uh, we're trying to formulate some some, some interesting uh, question because there are two topics that really interest me. But if we go with the, the issue about best practices for sharing authority for players not used to it, well, you also say, or those who don't want it. And I'm kind of a kind of in the mode of saying if somebody doesn't want to do something, I mean, we are talking about a voluntary activity here, right? So if you genuinely don't want that kind of situational authority, you're fine with the situational authority of saying, my guy walks across the room, right? Or I try to pick the lock. Those are on, you know, ongoing in the situation. They're confined in a very specific way to your own character's movements. And you're fine with that. But you really don't want a situational authority in terms of, for example, what's in the room. Yep. So, okay, that's but that's okay, right? I mean, that's okay if somebody doesn't want it. You can't uh, yeah. make them like it, after all, right? So let's leave that person alone. I don't want to, you know, give that guy a break. He's allowed yeah. to like the distribution of authorities that they like. So, but let's but let's talk about the not used to it. We're going to presume that we're mm -hmm. talking with people or playing with people who are, you know, they, they, might, they might like it. But you're right. Habits will get in the way. And I will tell you a couple of ways that this can go kind of wrong. Mm -hmm. For one thing, there are different kinds of authority. And if you give a person a particular kind of authority that they're not used to having, they'll suddenly think they have all of them. And yep. so, because they're used to like those two things always going together. And so if you give them this one, the other one must come with it. And a good example comes in a game like the pool where you have the option on a success of, you know, being the one who describes it. And so say you take that option that gives you outcome, you no, know, gives you narration authority over this outcome that we've just done. Mm -hmm. So we knew you beat the guy. Now do you, you know, now you get, you saying, oh, I can describe this. Well, mm -hmm. you know, you, I think I may have mentioned this in a, I'm getting confused about what I said in which conversation. So <laughs> forgive me if I'm repeating myself, but if I, I am playing this character and I have beaten the kill, I have caught the killer clown. Right. I made my roll. I caught the killer clown. I grabbed him. Right. Now, the game master quite rightly says, do you want to die for your pool? Or do you want your monologue of victory? And I say, hmm, I want my monologue of victory. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm thinking about the, you know, I'm thinking about the bastard DM who's GM who's probably going to like have the clown kill himself or something. Right. You know, before he. You know, some shit like that. No, I want the monologue of, of victory here. I want to say how this turns mm -hmm. out. So I say, I'll take the monologue of victory. And I tear off his rubber mask, son of a bitch clown, right? I Or I wipe off the makeup or whatever it takes, right? Mm -hmm. I want to see this guy's, I see his face. Excellent. You had narration authority. You are narration, not narrative. I hate that narration the one who talks about the outcome right mm -hmm. so you take you you formally have it even if everybody made a bunch of suggestions mm -hmm. probably because they're overexcited about catching the killer clown so they can't help themselves and they make all these suggestions yeah fine you get to say them no matter who mm -hmm. says what so you say i you know we, we find out who he is right it's a rubber it's a rubber mask i pull off the rubber mask like scooby-doo and mm -hmm. if I mistakenly think that having narration authority also gives me backstory authority, mm -hmm. then I'm going to say who the killer clown is because I think I'm mm -hmm. allowed to. But the pool doesn't have that. You don't get backstory authority when you take the monologue of victory. You would have mm -hmm. to ask the person who has the backstory authority who is it? Your narration authority has established that you, this is one of the consequences of your victory. You get to look. Mm -hmm. Who is it? And they'd have to tell you. 